Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining uh, our webinar in uh, this important uh, but uh, sometimes uh, really uh, topic, topic in our industry. I am your host, Marisabel Caballero, and I am a work uh, global technical manager for poultry in uh, the German-based uh, company EW Nutrition. With me, I have uh, Felipe Barbosa, with whom uh, I will share the stage. Uh, Felipe is uh, the global technical manager uh, for swine, and he will be speaking about biosecurity in swine production. Felipe, please uh, give a short introduction of yourself. Thank you, Marisabel. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining our webinar. As Marisabel said, I'm working as the global technical manager for swine at Ida Nutrition. I've been working in the industry for the past 20, 10 years, and uh, now I'm here based in Germany with EW Nutrition. I will explain and try to show you also some figures about biosecurity and big farms. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, we have with us a Mexican expert, Martin Roa, and uh, he is uh, joining the webinar uh, to help us with the question and answer session. Martin, please introduce yourself. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, well, good morning from Mexico, and we enjoy that you stay with us. We know that it will be very useful for you, and here we are at your, at your order, whatever you need. Welcome. Thank you both. Um, uh, uh, well, uh, today uh, we will be speaking about the importance or the value of biosecurity uh, in animal nutrition. But first, I would like to give you some technical points to explain the setup of the webinar. I will uh, deliver uh, my presentation in about 20 to 25 minutes, and so will do Felipe. After that, uh, we will have a question and answer session. Also, during the presentations, you can also ask your questions using uh, the Q&A uh, panel located at the bottom of your, of your screen. Uh, please uh, write down your questions and most probably they will be answered in instantly. However, if uh, there are some questions that require a more elaborate answer or if they are of general interest, they will be uh, addressed in the discussion after the webinar. Um, uh, once uh, we are done, uh, you can leave some feedback if you would like it. And uh, once again, uh, thanks for being here. And now let's start. Well, uh, today we will speak about how we can convert knowledge about disease into biosecurity practice, which attitudes and behaviors we need to implement uh, in the context of uh, the principles of uh, biosecurity for uh, making a good biosecurity program. We will address uh, what is uh, the cost of uh, biosecurity versus the cost of disease. And uh, then uh, we will speak about biosecurity in general in terms of poultry and swine production. And at the end of the webinar, uh, we will uh, finish with some key messages for you. Well, uh, first I would like to say that a very key principle in epidemiology is uh, uh, that disease does not occur randomly in a population. Um, disease is more likely to occur in certain members of the group at certain times and with specific conditions. Disease then, uh, we can say, follows specific patterns. However, there are not only these patterns, but also different factors uh, that can influence disease. Uh, therefore, we can also say that disease is multifactorial. And uh, we can find direct and indirect factors working together to produce disease. Uh, with the knowledge of these patterns and with the knowledge of uh, these factors, uh, we can find ways to reduce the frequency, severity, and impact of disease. And this, of course, uh, constitutes the base uh, that uh, we uh, use uh, around uh, biosecurity. Disease uh, can be then introduced onto a farm in a number of ways. Uh, we know uh, that any agent that is uh, capable to carry, uh, to carry uh, the cause of disease or the agent causing the disease is uh, a potential uh, vector into it. And uh, then uh, we can find in poultry production, for example, wild birds uh, being a very important carrier and transmitter of disease. 
uh, we can find on the a second line uh, that the pests Pets uh, and vermin are also very important in terms of uh, controlling a uh, disease in uh, poultry uh, setups. And uh, of course, we should not forget about the human factor or uh, the uh, human uh, vectors uh, that we can find around disease. Uh, and uh, then here we can find the workers uh, of the farms as well as uh, visitors of any kind. There are, of course, other um, ways in uh, which a disease can be introduced into the farm and this is also a knowledge uh, that we need when uh, making a good biosecurity programs. Besides this, uh, we need also to know five principles which help us to uh, avoid entrance and spread of disease. These principles are separation, reduction, focus, repetition and scaling. And we will be uh, talking about each of them right now. Well, the first uh, principle, as mentioned before, is separation. Know your enemy, but in this case, do not keep it close. It is uh, vital uh, that uh, we have uh, uh, the source of disease at a different place uh, of the sensitive population. So the uh, disease shouldn't reach the sensitive uh, population. And for that, of course, social distancing uh, works very well. Uh, but uh, uh, we can find other ways in uh, farm setups, uh, such as uh, having a de good defined farm perimeters, separating high and low, low risk animals. And how do we uh, know what is the risk of the animals? Well, for example, separating healthy and uh, ill animals or uh, separating the animals by their age. More better, having uh, all in, all out farms is uh, uh, one of the best uh, setups that we can find in terms of biosecurity. And of course, also separating the areas. Inside the farm, we can separate dirty and uh, clean internal areas. The second uh, principle is reduction. And in reduction, uh, we are trying to weaken the enemy so it doesn't spread. So which, who is our enemy and how it will not spread? Uh, the enemy, of course, is infection, any uh, agent that is uh, capable of uh, transmitting disease. And what we want is to keep the pressure of, of infection at levels uh, that are uh, beneath uh, the animal's uh, um, availability or ability to cope with. And uh, that means uh, the immune system of the animal. So um, uh, the goal uh, is uh, here uh, to weaken all infection agents or uh, to uh, reduce uh, uh, their numbers. And for that, uh, we have cleaning and disinfection programs uh, that aim uh, to reduce uh, uh, the, the microbial uh, population in the barns. Uh, we have uh, vaccination programs uh, that, uh, that uh, have the objective of um, uh, increasing the immunity uh, of uh, the animals and having stronger animals in the case of mild infections. And uh, uh, other um, actions uh, that can be taken here are, for example, the reduction of stocking density, the change of footwear when entering a production house. So we do not carry uh, infection agents uh, when we uh, enter the house. And uh, of course, uh, washing our hands. The next principle refers to focus. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, we need to make some evaluations in order to be able to hunt elephants and uh, not to spend our time chewing butterflies. That means uh, that we need to know which pathogens are the ones uh, that we really have a risk uh, for and uh, uh, that also are having some higher economic importance. At the same time, uh, of course, we need to evaluate the frequency of occurrence of these uh, pathogens. Um, as probably we will also identify that there are some periods in, this, in, this, in which these uh, pathogens are more uh, frequent or that we are at a higher risk. And uh, we need to evaluate if the roots and introduction of spread of uh, these pathogens are significant or not. In general terms, um, um, we uh, can find uh, that there are uh, some uh, roots of introduction and spread that have a low risk, uh, such as speed, 
uh, or uh, a lower, uh, uh, even a, a slightly higher risk, uh, such as uh, pets, uh, pests, vermin, wild birds, etc. The wind uh, can also have an increasing risk in comparison uh, with uh, the pest, and uh, uh, so on. Uh, of course, the higher uh, risk uh, will be brought by the animal, um, but, sorry, by the human factor, and the higher risk is uh, the animal factor, so the transmission from animal to animal in a case uh, of disease. So the biosecurity program should focus first on high risk, uh, ways of introduction of spread and on high risk pathogens. And then subsequently, uh, we can address uh, the lower uh, risk um, routes and uh, pathogens. And the next principle, and uh, this is the fourth one, is uh, repetition. Or in frequent danger, the probability of injury, uh, of course, increases. So. Uh, like I said before, we need to evaluate the risk uh, of each pathogen and the risk of each transmission route, but also we need to know how frequent this risk is going to be. And uh, in this case, uh, we need to take into account, for example, visitors. How often is uh, the veterinary uh, coming into the farm? How often is he really needed? And if this repeated uh, behavior uh, will um, increase uh, the risk of uh, a pathogen introduction and spread. Um, another uh, risk uh, can be found in the way the mortality pickup is uh, done and the frequency in which the mortality pickup is done. And uh, uh, of course, how the mortality is, uh, is uh, managed. And uh, by that, uh, we mean where is uh, the mortality being stored in the farm or is it being stored already outside the farm where it will uh, reduce uh, the risk uh, significantly. Uh, feed deliveries uh, can also be a risk if not managed, uh, if not, if not managed well. And uh, in uh, a poultry production, uh, we also have thinning and uh, the thinning is uh, a one uh, of uh, the most significant breaches in biosecurity. And some farms even may have a uh, two uh, thinnings before the final slaughter, which uh, puts the animal in a, a higher risk of infection and spread of disease. Um, the last um, principle is scaling. And uh, what do we mean by that? We mean that in the multitude, it is uh, very easy to disguise. Uh, and uh, uh, that is uh, exactly that in bigger operations, uh, we have a higher risk of disease introduction and spread. And why is that? Well, because we have more uh, uh, animals, uh, we have more risk. Um, the animals, uh, because they are numerous, uh, there is a higher opportunity to, for them to be in contact with disease agents. Also, when a disease agent uh, enters the farm or uh, the house, uh, there is also more animals that are going to be infected because uh, they are uh, more crowded. And uh, uh, also it is uh, much easier uh, to, for the infection cycle uh, to be maintained. Well, we have uh, checked out uh, the five uh, principles in which uh, we need uh, to uh, base uh, biosecurity programs. And uh, biosecurity programs are very important in animal production again, because they can lower the risk of uh, introduction and spread of disease. But of course, this comes with a cost. And uh, what is in general terms, the cost of biosecurity? Um, it uh, will rank then uh, between two and 2.5% of the production cost in the case of poultry. And uh, this is uh, more, or less, more or less an average that is true for uh, many regions. Uh, how is this 2 to 2.5% uh, spent in? Well, 55% uh, of the cost of biosecurity is spent in disease prevention. What do we mean by disease prevention? Uh, for example, in vaccination programs, uh, but as well in uh, feed additives or uh, farm applications uh, that aim uh, to prevent disease, uh, such as organic acids or phytomolecules. Um, the second uh, category uh, will be uh, cleaning and disinfection. And so this is uh, the second higher expense in uh, biosecurity programs, and it totally makes sense. Um, the, 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 
the next one uh, will be pest control, which is also a basic part of uh, any uh, biosecurity program. Um, uh, if uh, we take a look at one study in Finland, uh, for them, uh, the biosecurity investment was uh, in uh, broiler farms uh, 3.5 euro cents and in uh, breeder farms 75 cents uh, per uh, house hen, just to have an idea. And this represented for them 2% of the total production cost. In terms of work time, of course, there is also an investment uh, when uh, we think about biosecurity. It means more work for uh, each of the persons that are, are involved in the farm. That can mean in uh, broiler farms up to 8% of, the, of their daily, ta daily time. And in uh, uh, broiler breeders, it may represent up to 5% of uh, their daily time. Is this a good investment? Well. We will see in the next slide what is the cost of this is. And uh, at first glance, uh, we can see that it is uh, really higher uh, than the cost of prevention. So yes, this is a good investment. In terms uh, of the cost of disease, it can rank from a few cents per animal, depending on the challenges uh, that we have, to the total cooling of the farm, which is dramatic. Uh, prevention uh, does not comprise only biosecurity, of course, as disease is multifactorial. Uh, but uh, the measures uh, then uh, to prevent disease uh, should also uh, take into account uh, different factors. Even nutrition, even management have to be involved uh, a little bit in disease prevention. Um, uh, to illustrate how high the cost of biosecurity can be, um, there is a, a case uh, of uh, a, high, a highly pathogenic avian influenza. So uh, in this regards, a report from the USDA states that in the outbreak of 2014-2015, more than 50 million poultry animals died in the US because uh, of uh, this outbreak. And they died because of the disease or because they have to be uh, cooled or they have to be spared uh, in order to stop the spreading uh, of uh, the outbreak. So this is uh, quite high. And uh, if uh, we take uh, these birds that die, they represent around 12% of uh, the US table egg laying uh, population and around 8% of the estimated inventory of turkeys uh, grown for meat. So uh, this is uh, also uh, can uh, get uh, really dramatic. And uh, uh, what we see here is uh, that biosecurity helps or aim uh, to help uh, to uh, prevent uh, this uh, kind of disease. And biosecurity is not a matter of uh, only the farm, uh, but uh, biosecurity is also a matter of the area. So different uh, players uh, have to get together in order to make more effective uh, biosecurity uh, plans in uh, especially uh, when uh, we are uh, facing epidemics. In this case uh, we have uh, some examples here uh, of uh, and comparing the cost of some uh, diseases uh, with the cost uh, of uh, prevention. So in the case of uh, necrotic enteritis uh, when we uh, find outbreaks of uh, necrotic enteritis, we may spend up to 35 uh, cents per bird in comparison uh, with some uh, very strong uh, prevention programs, uh, which can cost around 15 uh, cents and uh, so on. In the case of uh, high pathogenic avian influenza here, the cost uh, due to disease uh, is not complete, but it's on only the cost of calling one bird. And of course, if you call the bird, uh, then uh, you will get uh, uh, yeah you will get a, a lot of more losers uh, in this case, and uh, uh, this represents here uh, the cost of uh, an average uh, biosecurity program. But of course, um, uh, we know and we all know that uh, biosecurity is uh, very important. But despite of the recognized importance of biosecurity, and which is known uh, from uh, practice and research. Uh, there are still points in which the application of uh, biosecurity programs can improve in farms. But how to quantify biosecurity? Well, many companies have uh, their own scores 
and also some research groups have uh, worked in some standard scores. What is important for you to know is that if you have a score, you have to see how this score is evolving in time and how you are um, making action plans and actually consecuting the actions uh, that are in this plan to improve the score uh, in uh, uh, time. Um, uh, among uh, the uh, many uh, biosecurity questionnaires uh, that we can find or the quantifications uh, of biosecurity, uh, there is a group at Ghent University which is led by Jeroen de Wolf. Um, they develop a score system uh, that takes into account external and internal biosecurity for different production animals. And the questionnaire um, was applied uh, in this case uh, to uh, 399 uh, broiler farms across five European countries. So this is where we can uh, see that there is really a room for improvement uh, in uh, any a country, I think, or in many farms uh, in regard uh, with biosecurity. Uh, this uh, program or this uh, questionnaire was applied in 2017, so quite recently. And um, in this case, uh, the external biosecurity tended to score lower than uh, the internal uh, biosecurity. Uh, which points uh, could they uh, found that were the weakest, let's say, or that uh, most opportunities uh, were found? Well, one uh, of the points uh, was uh, visitors and staff, which we can see in um, at the orange uh, part of the bar. Uh, this, is, uh, this means uh, that uh, uh, there is a lot of room for improvement in the entrance procedures uh, on the farms and in how the visitors and the staff manages uh, also inside the farm. Another point that was uh, a weak, we can say it's the population, which implies that thinning is a common practice. And uh, in uh, uh, this practice, we are introducing uh, persons into the farm that may not, may not adhere to the biosecurity program or to the biosecurity rules uh, that are in place. Um, uh, another uh, measure that uh, was low in this case in internal biosecurity is um, um, uh, the um, uh, inter-house uh, management, uh, which is uh, the uh, green uh, part of the barns. What does it imply? It implies that one worker can be responsible for several houses and not enough measures are being taken to avoid the spread of pathogens among uh, these houses when uh, the same person is in charge. These European scores, however, can relate with issues that farmers may be facing worldwide. And uh, in these terms, uh, we can find that there is still a lot of room for improvement in terms of biosecurity. And we have to be very critical with our own cases. And we have to establish action plans that can be followed up. And uh, uh, I think the most important part here is uh, the compliance. Uh, so the persons uh, that are working in the farm need to really adhere really to live and really to make a culture of uh, uh, the biosecurity program. Well, we uh, already saw that there is room for improvement, but what happens in, uh, when we improve? With improvement of biosecurity, not only uh, we can achieve, let's say, less introduction and spread of disease, uh, but also better performance. And on top of that, uh, we can also lower the use of antimicrobials. The same questionnaire that we were talking about was applied to 15 broiler farms in Belgium. And that is a study from a few years back. So it was published in 2014. And the questionnaire was applied to times. A first time to establish a baseline. So this is the first score. And then based on this first score, an action plan was done and was followed up for one year. So one year after the second score was taken. Um, after uh, one year, the implementation of the extra biosecurity measures, uh, well, result in an improvement of uh, both the external and internal biosecurity score. 
And on top of that, uh, this influence performance. The total mortality, for example, decreased from uh, 3.40, uh, no, 54 uh, to 3.05. And uh, the field conversion rate also decreased 10 points. On top of that, uh, the antimicrobial use was reduced in nine farms. So we can see uh, that there was an average um, anti antibiotic use of minus 29%. So uh, they, they were able to reduce the antibiotic usage by almost 30%. And these are good news. But of course, this is uh, uh, the application of uh, uh, biosecurity measures in farms that are, well, let's say, uh, more uh, healthy uh, than a uh, disease. So they may have the occasional outbreaks. But uh, what happens uh, if uh, we have a disease that is uh, tackling a region? Well, in times of disease, biosecurity is not or might not be a matter of only one farm or only one company. And uh, this case here illustrates how together two broiler companies successfully managed to eradicate an outbreak of infectious laryngotracheitis. In 2005, in California, uh, there was an outbreak that couldn't be stopped with vaccination and the standard practices of biosecurity. And uh, in uh, this area, which had a 25 kilometer radius or 50 kilometer uh, diameter, uh, were uh, found 57 farms, and these 57 farms uh, belong to two companies. So the two companies uh, growing poultry animals in the area decided to attempt a joint control um, strategy. The strategy involved uh, a few things, uh, such as, of course, uh, vaccination, but at the same time, uh, they uh, extended their downtime uh, between flocks, and that, mean, that meant that they will uh, uh, probably, not probably, but for sure, end up with having less flocks per year. Um, but at the same time, uh, of course, uh, this was necessary in order to eradicate uh, this uh, disease. Um, uh, they also went for improved uh, cleaning and disinfection protocols, as well as an extensive biosecurity audit. And of course, the follow-up of the action plans of these biosecurity audits, checklists, and so on. Moreover, they also um, changed uh, the routes uh, and the uh, protocols uh, were appointed to move birds to the slaughterhouse and uh, to move uh, or to transport the used litter. In, uh, uh, they were uh, looking for avoiding the farm roads, even if they had to take a longer distance, right? they avoided to pass uh, the farms uh, that, uh, at, that had a poultry at the, at the time uh, when they were uh, moving birds to the slaughterhouse or when, when they were moving a uh, used litter. Well, uh, what happened uh, to this company? Well, after two flocks, of course, uh, they were uh, monitoring uh, LT, but after two flocks, bo uh, both companies uh, were virtually free of uh, uh, LT. And uh, this program uh, basically gives credibility to the importance of cooperation uh, when we have biosecurity issues of cooperation when we have outbreaks. So in this case, uh, we can see um, uh, how uh, the disease uh, or the detection of the disease evolved uh, from the outbreak in the red bars uh, to when they only implemented vaccination uh, with standard biosecurity to the green bars when where they implemented the whole protocol that was described. So biosecurity really works uh, when uh, we all uh, work together and when different stakeholders uh, have uh, the relationship and the aim uh, to stop disease outbreaks. Um, uh, another uh, point in uh, which uh, biosecurity can be very important is uh, uh, in the appearance and prevalence of uh, bacteria which is related with foodborne diseases. Campylobacter is one of the most common enteric pathogens worldwide, and it's also a source of uh, antimicrobial resistant genes uh, from um, uh, poultry, for example, or from animals uh, to humans. Um, uh, there are, of course, uh, many factors uh, that influence uh, Campylobacter appearance and prevalence, and uh, we will illustrate uh, some of them 
And what is uh, the percentage of production of persistence of the bacteria, which is illustrated by the different bars here. So first, let's talk about water. Water has been identified as a potential reservoir of uh, Campylobacter. So water disinfection can, uh, of course, uh, successfully um, reduce uh, Campylobacter in uh, stone blocks if uh, we take water disinfection alone. Also, uh, we can uh, see a seasonal prevalence uh, for Campylobacter uh, during the summer. And uh, this may be uh, related uh, with the transmission of the disease by flies. And therefore, uh, when fly screens uh, are added uh, to uh, some farms uh, that do not, having, uh, do not have them, the prevalence uh, of uh, the bacteria is lower. Thinning. Uh, thinning, uh, like we said, is, uh, is a very uh, dangerous activity in terms of biosecurity because it involves catching things and equipment that is entering the farm. So, and uh, uh, these teams uh, may not uh, be consistent uh, with the biosecurity practices of the farm or may not adhere completely uh, to biosecurity practices. Even flocks that are negative to Campylobacter when thinning occurs may become positive after the event. Uh, so uh, this is uh, one uh, of the most uh, uh, important uh, points. So if you discontinue thinning, uh, the probability or the prevalence of Campylobacter can be reduced to up to 40% or even more in uh, some farms, even in farms uh, with uh, good uh, biosecurity. Um, uh, finally, if uh, uh, we take uh, different biosecurity measures, and this uh, can also include the, the implementation of hygiene locks, um, uh, it, uh, it can uh, dramatically reduce uh, the prevalence uh, of uh, Campylobacter and several studies have demonstrated it. So if uh, we take uh, um, different biosecurity improvements, uh, the prevalence of Campylobacter can be reduced to uh, up to, to uh, 65% in some studies. So uh, different, uh, the, the combination of uh, different practices is what works better. But of course, uh, Campylobacter is not only a factor or is a, cannot uh, be, uh, let's say, um, avoided uh, or a control only uh, with the biosecurity. There are other factors uh, that need to take uh, to be taken into account. So, but uh, the bottom line here is uh, that disease uh, control requires a multidisciplinary approach, and the combination of uh, different uh, biosecurity measures uh, will uh, lead uh, to uh, a successful uh, reduction of uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, bacteria. Um, uh, finally, I want uh, to finish uh, saying how better biosecurity can help in the reduction of uh, antimicrobial resistance. And uh, this is um, a summary that uh, David and Wales uh, made uh, about the risk relationships between several par factors and the occurrence of uh, antimicrobial resistance. So, uh, for example, good biosecurity and hygiene has a negative interaction uh, with antibiotic use, and it thus it has also a negative interaction with the appearance or uh, the prevalence of uh, antimicrobial resistant genes in uh, pathogens or uh, in commensal bacteria. Uh, and uh, this is um, and this is. I think uh, uh, the main uh, issue or the main uh, factor in which biosecurity can collaborate with the reduction uh, of antibiotics by reducing antibiotic use and by reducing antibiotic use, uh, of course, uh, we will reduce the risk uh, of uh, antimicrobial resistance. Um, um, as an example, or in, a, in practice, uh, an investigation done in uh, the UK with 235 turkey farms associated biosecurity practice with the responsible use of uh, antibiotics. And the farms that had high biosecurity scores presented less antimicrobial resistant genes in a uh, commercial E. coli. So biosecurity then, besides probably lowering antimicrobial resistance or helping in lower antimicrobial resistance, aids in increasing productivity and farm profitability in the long term. And this means less disease. Up to here, 
Thank you very much uh, for uh, your attention. I will uh, close this part and uh, wait uh, for uh, Felipe uh, to continue with the presentation on biosecurity for soil. Thanks, Marisabel. Thanks everybody for being here with us. Um, we are, of course, uh, we are shifting gears a little bit uh, to, towards uh, swine production. Uh, I would like to start with this uh, beautiful Kansas State University. Uh, Marisabel explained that biosecurity is for our industry and for the livestock industry in general. With one remarkable point from Marisabel's presentation. Marisabel said that better biosecurity will bring us to a less occurrence of specific disease. And this is going to be the outline of our presentation today. Um, the swine farmers worldwide, they are, of course, constantly looking for improved economical standard of the operations. This is the ultimate objective of any enterprise, regardless. Of, but especially for us, especially for livestock, controlling these avoiding outbreaks and are crucial when financial health is concerned. For pig producers and for the whole, for the industry in general, the most recent and the most famous case of biosecurity issues is of course African swine fever. No? African swine fever, as we all know, caused the damage made without precedence in the Chinese market, on the Chinese swine production, but also on the worldwide protein market. According to, um, to a recent report that we found that was uh, from a FAO website and it was presented in a PIC uh, web conference, African swine fever has hit the countries that host around 60% of the global pork production. I repeat, 60% of the global pork production was hit somehow and in some degree with African swine, swine fever. And we have to be honest here, it's really difficult still to measure the impact in terms of number of pigs. We do have a lot of research and a lot of articles on that. Uh, and some of them say that the, the population of pigs decreased to an extent of 30% worldwide, but others say that this is much higher. Uh, that could reach something around 50% of the pig population decreased worldwide. So regardless if it's 30 or 50 or 60, the impact was devastating. And of course, in situations like this, when massive outbreaks hit the global or even the regional pig industry, the basic need for profitability in our operations or the feeling that we need to do something to avoid this becomes even more clear. So what we have learned with African swine fever or what we are still learning with African swine fever. The main thing is that we cannot keep things that it was before in, swine, uh, in, the swine uh, in, in the swine industry worldwide. We do have still in several countries, a lot of bottlenecks in our production system. And we do have to take actions to completely withdraw these failures, as I call here, from the pig industry. With African swine fever, one lesson was the importance of biosecurity. As you know, the topic was uh, everywhere. No? We don't have vaccines to stop the virus. So the topic biosecurity was everywhere. We found the topic, for example, in online magazines, like for example, the National Hog Farmer, that they mentioned, they, uh, that they, they mentioned that key to control African swine fever is biosecurity. But we also found at the official website of Food and Agriculture Organization of the United, States, United Nations do have a brochure talking about biosecurity and pig operations worldwide. It was clear with the African swine fever that we still need to do a lot in terms of biosecurity for the pig industry. But what about non-catastrophic disease? We have to understand that non, not only these massive outbreaks can play a role on farm profitability. This is a summary presented by a group of swine experts from Iowa State University during the 2020 Kansas State University Swine Profitability Conference. According to these specialists, PERS is still the most economically significant disease to affect USA after the eradication of classical swine fever. 
And according to their research, peers could lead to losses up to $13 per pig. Well, if we are free of peers in free or in a given region, this is how we want to be, correct? We don't want peers to be introduced to our herd, bringing the losses that we are looking at. But also, more, let's say, common bacteria as, for instance, Lausonia intracellularis, if not under control, will proliferate in one given herd and could lead to up to seven pounds per pig losses due to consequences of ileitis. So it's not only the big famous African swine fever and the purse and classical swine fever. We also do have to pay attention on the damage that regular pathogens that we found in most of the farms so to our operations or to the operations of our customers. In this specific paper presented by the guy, uh, one of the minimized losses suggested by them is of course in biosecurity, to spend time on and creating uh, great On what are the drivers for disease control in pig farms? So basically, we would pretty and disease control. This is a paper published in 2013, where the authors tried to explain pig farmers' perceptions and attitudes and how this can change the strategy for disease operations. It's interesting to see that the feeling of not being able to stop something harmful or as they describe in the paper a feeling of despair and the feeling of entering in an economically critical situation is side by side or are side by side by productivity parameters productivity that we all know as for instance pig mortality reduced fine weight so these according to the authors are the main drivers for disease control in pig farms, yeah? Uh, and it, interesting to see also that from, from this specific report that according to the authors, one of the reasons why biosecurity measures were not yet implemented in some farms to avoid this, for instance, pig mortality or reduce fine weight, final weight, it was due to, as simple as it can sound, lack of knowledge about the biosecurity topic. Of course, we have, uh, we have to make a remark here that the paper was published in 2013, so it was before this global African swine fever outbreak, but it gives us indication that we should every now and then talk about biosecurity with our customers and within our industry, because there's still a on biosecurity. What are then the costs of biosecurity or, or what are the opportunity of biosecurities in general? So when we talk about modifying or adapting farms towards more strict biosecurity protocols, we obviously, obviously, obviously think about what we call here the nominal costs now, or the amount of money and resources that we we'll have to spend in our farms. So Marisa Bell showed us the cost of the single interventions in, in a biosecurity plan for poultry. But what we have to understand is that it's extremely important to have a complete biosecurity plan. So we always have to consider the cost and the actual risk. So there's always a balance between the amount we have to spend in our farms and the risks that we have in our farm. What we can see is that one single breach in our biosecurity plan can destroy the health status of a herd or even affect the health status of our neighbor farm or even a country. When, for instance, diseases like African swine fever and have a, 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 a really fast way of spreading can affect the whole country. Yeah, and this loss could have long lasting and devastating production and financial effects on any farm, on any country, or even on the protein market worldwide, as mentioned. So once again, let me repeat myself. We have to take the most advantage of biosecurity. 
we need to have a deep understanding on the farm. We need to talk to specialists. We need to have a look on production parameters that will impose, for example, the greatest risks, rate, uh, rather than low risk activities in our farm. And this is how we have to start planning our biosecurity plans. One quite useful and easy to use tool was already presented by Marisabel. And as she mentioned, put some clarity on that not all disease transmission routes have the same risk factor. So this is extremely important for understanding how and when are we gonna take actions in our farms. Yeah? There's a lot going on in terms of feed biosecurity in our, in our industry nowadays. But if you look at this specific paper from the Ghent University, generally speaking, feed has somehow a low risk. But in terms of piglets and in terms of poultry, bringing animals or new animals to our farms this brings a high risk and everything that we are looking at here they are related to internal but also external uh, biosecurity and we don't want to explain again the concept but just um, on a glance external and internal biosecurity could be defined as external in this case are actions that we take to keep diseases out of our herd internal biosecurity on the other hand is or are measures that we take to keep disease pressure low and not spreading from one group of animals to another one. Like for instance, we don't want the disease from the fattening unit to hit the piglet unit because it can be once again devastating. Normally what we see in terms of biosecurity is that there's a good relationship between both internal and external biosecurity. And both combined are the only way that pig producers will take the most advantage of their biosecurity plan and therefore will be the only way for increasing productivity and pay off the biosecurity and all the investment that they have done in their farms. Let's have a look here on some example for pig farms. So Marisabel has shown for poultry. Let's have a look on pig farms here. On this paper, the authors evaluated the correlation between different biosecurity interventions, either internal or external, and the correlation with performance. As we can see here, different aspects have shown positive relationship with, for instance, daily weight gain of fattening pigs. And in this specific case, they had a great emphasis on external biosecurity once again. And also they describe a little bit what was done. And one of the things that they was done was handling the pigs uh, or, or transporting the, the live animals. So being sure uh, from the animals that you are buying of the health status, but also handling carcass in the farm. And of course, internal biosecurity that was mentioned, cleaning, disinfection, and so on. Yeah. And this is also true when we look at feed conversion rate, uh, there's also a significant impact of the interventions on decreasing overall feed conversion rate of these same animals, uh, of these fattening pigs in closed or semi-closed pig farms in Europe. So also with different levels of risks. So this is a summary of farms with different levels of risk. General or generally speaking, we do see a better average daily gain and, and, and a reduction on feed conversion rate. And finally, also mortality was, of course, in, have, uh, uh, have been impacted or have been uh, um, uh, changed, positively changed when biosecurity was put in place. Here, what you can see is that there was a reduction on mortality rate in pigs at weaning, but also in fattening pigs. And I don't, I, I, I do understand that in this specific case, in this specific paper, there was no statistical difference between mortalities in one group and the other one. But we have to keep in mind that the results are real numbers to the farmers. As for instance, it, in terms of mortality in the fattening side, we are talking about coming from a situation of 3% mortality to a 2.1% mortality. So it's in fact, money in the pocket of the producer. 
But let's have a look uh, on one really, really specific example. As I said before, regardless of the species that we are talking about, introducing live animals in a herd, despite the benefits and the reasons for it, brings a certain degree of danger to our operations. This is therefore, or should be on the top three biosecurity interventions when planning and executing a biosecurity plan. This is interesting because it comes from Ireland. Um, not everybody, to be honest, not everybody from this specific group have a look on Ireland, but in Ireland, they managed to have really low risk to one of the major external factor, which is bringing animals to our herd. According to the publication, 95% of the farms in Ireland, they only buy semen from genetic companies, which means that they are not buying guilds, they are not purchasing guilds. No? So they are not bringing this external factor to their operations. And although we still need some more data from different countries, the associations found in this specific paper between biosecurity categories and productivity performance suggests that in general, farms with good overall biosecurity in the swine industry had better performance, as shown here, and higher number of piglets per sow per year. So the animals presented higher average daily gain and the farm in general, or the farms in general with higher biosecurity levels had also a higher number of piglets per sow per year. And this is also can be uh, 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 biosecurity, as Marisabel mentioned, can also be a strategy to something else, can also be a strategy to reduce antimicrobials. So in terms of profitability of our farms, profit, uh, uh, performance and antimicrobial use are correlated. So they are side by side when calculating the profitability of our farms. And this is a study published in 2016 where the author summarized the, possi the possible associations between the biosecurity level, the antimicrobial use and farm production in 227 feral to finish pig herds here in Europe. So farms from Belgium, France, Germany, and Sweden, also different types of production. Yeah? The assessment for this study was done by Biocheck from Ghent University. Uh, and we have seen previously in this present description of Biocheck. And the results are not surprising, to be honest. This is just a confirmation of what everything that we've been talking so far. The results showed that several external biosecurity played a significant role on reducing the amount of antimicrobials used in these countries, in these farms. And for them, as, as a, a highlight of the paper, is that the major point was avoiding the introduction of new pathogens to the system, which means avoiding the disruption system. Yeah. Um, but also, let's have a look on something else. This, is, uh, this, is, this table is coming from uh, also Jeroen de Wolf, a group from Ghent University. And they, it was, the idea here was to present the main routes for infection of different big pathogens. Yeah. As expected and also mentioned before, people do play an important role when this at a farm level. Yeah. Something that we not always pay attention when creating our biosecurity plans. Let's have a look on a pathogen that is common to every big E. coli. When we look at infection, almost every single step being able to spread E. coli to our herds. So this could stand for, and this is what this, uh, this paper here tried to show. In this experiment, the authors had as a main objective understand how we, and I call we here as farm workers or vets or nutritionists coming to the farm, play a role on the farm spread of E. coli. The interesting setup where two biosecurity interventions were compared. Simply before handling the changing before handling the pigs. And the results 
able to mechanically transmit E. coli within the farm, and that alone, neither hand washing clothes prevent the spread of the bacteria. Actually, more efficient than the first one, but a good reading out of this paper act more complex than then than only um, creating washing hand stations or showering instead. We have to have a complex overview of the system. And by doing this comp complete overview, we can also beauty plants. No? In Europe, we have high concern regarding antimicrobial resistance. No? And this is among producers, among and live, livestock farmers or producers here in, in Europe, they are encouraged to reduce the... Marisabel mentioned before that biosecurity is helping us on reducing in the poultry, in the poultry in antibiotics that will lead to, for instance, a lower degree of antimicrobial resistance and will most probably be correlated to productivity. But let's look at the swine situation at the moment. In the swine situation, the, the hot topic for us here in Europe is how we are gonna reduce the amount of zinc oxide in our operations as zinc oxide will be banned uh, in a couple of, of, of years. No? So there was this interesting paper from Denmark explaining or trying to explain winning without high levels of zinc oxide. And the main objective of the paper was to find correlations between different farms in Denmark that are actually raising pigs without therapeutic levels of zinc oxide. And the conclusions of this, study, this, this, this specific study is that external biosecurity was practiced in the majority of the farms from 22 from uh, 24 farms that joined this study were part of the Danish specific pathogen free system or the SPF system. And one of the things that these farms were doing were, was creating clear rules in terms of people coming into the farm, regardless if it's a, it's a random visitor or if it's the staff of the farm. They had clear rules that they should follow. Also, internal biosecurity between sections and pens in the farms, as for instance, boot change between sections and separate tools used in each section, for example, by color, minimize the transmission or the, the, the level of infection. And this is, in fact, really simple to do, but also extremely efficient. Now, we talk about that all the time, but still, if we go into farms, we see that not always we are using the same equipment only for that specific part of the herd. We don't want to move, for example, these equipment from the growing finishing to the lactation and then to the, to the nursery phase. We do have and we do need uh, specific tools for every single step of the, of the production. And we also have to understand that, generally speaking, in Denmark, 70% of the cells are under this program. Yeah? A program that, by definition, is a health monitoring program, but it is highly dependent on biosecurity practice. And just before we finalize, I want to explain a little bit more about this Danish-specific pathogen free and how this is correlated to biosecurity. The program is based on three pillars. The first one is protection against infection that ensures that infectious disease is not introduced into the herd, so external biosecurity. They do have clear protocols for receipt and delivery of piglets. Um, they have also distance to neighbor herd, protocols for visitors and delivery of feed, for instance. It's also based on the health inspection that has as main objective to ensure that disease is not spread for example, via, via trade and transport of animals. So they have um, daily inspections by staff or monthly inspection by a vet that report symptoms of different pathogens 
to the system so everybody knows what is going on in the different farms. Né? And this declaration of health status for individual herds and purchase of pigs will actually guarantee that when you're buying a pig, you do know the type of infection or the type of pathogens that that pig is bringing to your herd. Né? So it's a clear way to reduce external contamination or introduction of different pathogens in the herd. And as I said before, also a clear way to minimize the disruption of a running system. Okay. With that, I come to a conclusion of our webinar today. And what I can say here is that biosecurity is necessary for disease prevention in animal in any animal production system. Now, it's important when, for example, outbreaks uh, hit our industry, but also play a role to prevent the spread of disease within the same production unit. Biosecurity plans, they pay off as often they lead to performance improvement, reduced mortality, and reduced mobility in the farms. And creating and executing a, su a successful plan of biosecurity requires a deep understanding of the system, of course. Huh? Nowadays, also with the raising of antimicrobial resistance risk, these interventions of biosecurity also must be considered when creating antimicrobial reduction strategies. In our case, talking about zinc oxide, or as Marisabel mentioned, for the poultry industry, also to reduce the use of antibiotics. With that, I would like to finish our part here. And thank you once again for joining us, either this morning or this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. And we are, of course, now open for your questions. Thanks a lot for joining us. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Felipe, for that uh, great presentation. And uh, now uh, we will uh, go uh, through some of the questions that uh, were asked uh, during uh, both presentations. Uh, one I, that I find uh, particularly uh, interesting is um, what is the effect of animal welfare in biosecurity and biosecurity costs? This was uh, answered in written, uh, but I would like uh, all of uh, the participants uh, to uh, listen uh, to or, or to, uh, to have some knowledge about this. Um, uh, one of the main points of animal welfare, uh, known as uh, the five freedoms, is to keep the animals free from pain, injury, and disease. So, of course, uh, biosecurity and animal welfare have to go hand by hand. Uh, some animal welfare setups, uh, for example, uh, raising animals with lower stocking densities uh, is, uh, of course, uh, beneficial for any biosecurity program. Uh, but some others may increase the risk of disease. And here we are talking uh, about, for example, uh, free range animals. Uh, in uh, which uh, we need to take additional uh, biosecurity measures. So uh, in uh, uh, some of these setups, we will increase, of course, the cost of uh, biosecurity, uh, for, but for some others, uh, we will not really increase it. We need to evaluate each, um, each uh, production system uh, separately in order uh, to better establish uh, the risk. Um, there are uh, some other questions, uh, and I see that uh, uh, we have uh, some uh, new questions also in the panel. Um, uh, why uh, does uh, biosecurity improve animal production is uh, uh, one of the questions uh, that we have here. And uh, uh, in uh, this case, uh, well, uh, biosecurity uh, improves uh, animal production uh, because it maintains and it keeps the animals healthy. Healthy animals uh, basically uh, produce better. So when we adopt a very good uh, biosecurity programs, we uh, lower the risk of uh, introduction and spread of disease in the farm. We do have two more specific questions for poultry and layers, maybe Martin or Marisabel, you want to take that one, those ones? Yes, uh, um, of course. Um, uh, so, uh, oh, Martin, uh, you all already raised your hand uh, to answer one of the questions. Please go on. 
Yes, sir. Um, looking, looking at the first question, what is the factor of higher risk for introduction of AI in a farm? I, I suppose AI is having influenza. I, I, I think so. Or if there's an, an error, please tell me, please, just to answer this. Take it with avian influenza. I think it is uh, yes. AI. Is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the experience of Mexico, talking about this, this disease, um, one, one uh, key point of control influenza is the management of the personnel, the visits, and most important, the manual. If you take care about the manual, you can spread the less, and all the inside the, in, inside the, the farm, when you have several Asians in the same farm, you avoid this transmission. Remember that not, this not, not, not only is necessary to have the pathogens inside, the amount of pathogen that is how is transmitted disease is important. So if we decrease the amount of pathogens, we can control better. Obviously, with other 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 procedures like vaccine vaccination and like other uh, procedures you can find in in, in the farm. Okay, I will, I think, um, um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin, uh, for the answer here. Uh, we will stop the, the session uh, right away. We are uh, taking a few minutes uh, more than planned. But before you leave, uh, I would like uh, to ask you to answer a very uh, simple poll uh, that uh, uh, we have prepared in order uh, to uh, improve um, our uh, webinars in the future. So. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, your attendance. Uh, remember that if you have more questions or if you want to leave some comments, uh, please uh, do it uh, to the email that is uh, showing now on the screen, webinars at ewnutrition.com. And uh, with this poll, uh, which uh, you can start uh, answering at any time, um, uh, we say uh, goodbye for now. Uh, inviting also uh, you to attend uh, future uh, webinars uh, that we will have. Uh, please uh, follow us on LinkedIn or um, uh, use uh, uh, our website to find out about future webinars. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good day and uh, keep healthy. Until the next time. Thank Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Marcelo.